this question is, are devotionals useful? When you and say devotional, wait a minute. I think, like, the little booklets that um, you can get from, like, Our Daily Bread or you can buy from, like, Walmart and stuff. Yeah, of course. And their question is, how would you use them correctly? Because I guess they feel like they've been using them incorrectly. Well, the first thing is, I, I would say, you, you, all right, I'm sorry. Mm -hmm. Are devotionals? Are devotional books yeah. useful? I, I would say, how would I use it? How, how about just using it? <laughs> See, because most people, they like, well, you know, should I use it two times a day? Darling, if you use it, then that means some word is getting in you. Mm -hmm. Who cares how you use it? Use it every day. <laughs> Preach a message from it. <laughs> <laughs> right? Mm -hmm. I mean, Jesus said, "How when when the, when the disciples asked Jesus, how should you pray?" He said, "He said, give give me my daily bread. All you need is daily bread." Right? Mm -hmm. It didn't say. Read four chapters a day. <laughs> uh, make sure you read the book of Luke. And if you don't, mm -hmm. when you finish reading the book of Luke, go to Revelations. And when you get from Revelation, come on, people. Every <clears throat> little bit of word that you get in your spirit is important. Anytime you put a, a scripture, a verse, anything, in your spirit, you are sowing good seed. The Bible, the Bible lets us know that it is it is um it is profitable for reproof, correction, instruction. The re the reality is is that those who are not reading at all are the ones that's going to be in trouble, because when hard times come. They don't have a place to go. See, I think when people are, 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 are missing when it comes to your walk as a Christian is that from the time, let's just say from the time that before you got saved, right? Let's just say you got saved at 17, right? Up until you were 17, you were governed by your own selfish desires and selfish ways, right? So in order for those ways to be changed and reversed and to be converted, there has to be a new seed planted in your spirit and in your soul in order for you to now even to compete or to be able to fight off your, your fleshly desires. The reason why people are still fighting their flesh and fighting certain things is because they didn't read in the Bible where it says when you do certain things and you allow your flesh to take control. The Bible says, watch this, those who mind the things of the flesh, women, those who walk in the flesh do mind the things of the flesh. This is in Romans. Those who walk in the spirit do mind the things of the spirit. What am I saying? If you walk in the flesh, right? Because there's going to be a constant war between your flesh and your spirit. And most of the time what happens is we normally, you know, we lean towards our flesh because it is the comfortable, it's the comfort zone. But when you begin to strengthen your spirit and fortify your spirit, then all of a sudden you're like, whoa, 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 back, back up, flesh. Because I understand that being a, a, being a, a moment out of my place with God is not worth five minutes with you or five minutes of anger or a second of anger because now I'm not just displeasing, displeasing myself. I'm displeasing God. I don't want to be in a place in my life anymore where I am displeasing God. And this is where I learned, I learned this from the word of God. I didn't learn that from my mother. My mother taught me, you know, she taught me well. She taught me how to praise God. She taught me even, you know, hey, son, you know, the Lord knows what you're doing. Okay, I understand, Ma. Yeah, all right. 
I kept doing what I was doing, right? But then one day the Holy Ghost hit me. And when the Holy Ghost hit me, it was like, um, you got to stop doing what you're doing. You got to change your ways. If you don't change your ways, then guess what? You're headed for destruction. You know, we think that a lot of the mishaps that be happening in our life was by accident. No, no, I know some mishaps happened in my life because I wasn't in the right place at the wrong time. I was off. Well, you know what I mean. <laughs> mm -hmm. I wasn't in the right place. I didn't know. I, I was doing things that I know was against God's will. And so God is trying to get your attention. So he's nudging you. He's saying, all right, get back over here. All right? I never forget um, some years ago, I um, you know, I know I wasn't in the right place at the right time. I wasn't in, I wasn't in, I wasn't, come on. And things started falling apart in my life. And I'm going, I bet you this is because of this person. I bet you it's because of that person. And then one day I looked in the mirror and said, it's because of you, buddy. <laughs> I had to make some changes. And if I didn't make those changes immediately, my life was going to be destroyed all because of bad decisions. Mm -hmm. Amen? Amen. The next question What's is, up, what, is <laughs> what advice would you give to someone who feels they are falling backwards or slipping in their walk with God? Say, say that again. What advice would you give to someone who feels they are falling backwards or falling in their walk with God? I mean, this kind of goes back to some of the other things that I said, you know, because mm -hmm. um, that's that's somewhat of a dry place, too. You know, you start feeling like, you know, things are not moving in the right direction. You know, we got to stay focused. Let, 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 let me help you. You know, it, it amazes me. I never heard a person say, you know, I'm falling out of love of the club. <laughs> right? You see, you see how that funny that sounds? But we yeah. fall out of love with God. Why? Because there's a challenge. See, when we're doing the things of our flesh, the enemy ain't going to challenge us. I mean, God ain't going to, there's no challenge in that. You go into the club, you party up, bro, Saturday night, party <laughs> jumping, right? You thinking, while you at the club, you already thinking about how next week you're going to do the same thing. You ain't thinking about the dry places. And then got the nerve to think that if I get a little juice in my system, you know, that's going to take away all my problems. Isn't that something? See, most people don't realize that when even when it comes to alcohol, right? If you go to a real liquor spot, right? You go to the liquor spot, they call it spirits. <laughs> oh, come on now. They call they call it spirits. And what they don't realize is when they're drinking alcohol, even in the club, they're using the alcohol as a spirit, right? To ignite something within them or to cause them to be to, to remove all of the the stuff that's going on in their in their um life, right? Well, listen, when you go to church, <laughs> all I'm saying is let the Holy Spirit because the Bible says be not drunken with wine, but be full, be drunken with the the Holy Ghost, right? The Holy Spirit. <laughs> Hold on a second. Cause my my um thing is getting ready to go off. I don't know why. Anyway, it's not um working with me here. What's up? <laughs> hey, 
Esteban. <laughs> hey. Right? So they go to the club. They think that, you know, the, the liquor is is giving them a certain feeling, right? When you come to God, we got our own liquor. It's called <laughs> the Holy Ghost. And it is the Spirit of God that dwell within us, that, that revives us, that, that, that allows us to escape from the things of this world. That's what, see, but the problem is when people come to church, they come to church and they're like, you know, they're looking at people and, you know, I wonder if they know what's going on with me. And I wonder if they could tell them hi. Yeah, they could tell you hi. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, they could tell you hi. But that shouldn't be the most important thing. They, yeah, they could tell you, you, you start, yeah, they could tell. But the, the reality is, is if the church, understood how to respond to those things, they wouldn't make those people feel uncomfortable, but rather put them in a place where they're able to get the deliverance that they need so that they can get a breakthrough and realize that the alcohol and the drugs and all of that other stuff, is it cannot compare to being in a moment of worship and being in the atmosphere of God. It does not compare. I'm here to let you know. It don't compare. The reality is, is that when you live your life by your flesh, then your flesh is always going to rule over what your spirit is saying. But when you begin to walk in the spirit of God, and you allow the spirit of God to govern your life, then you want more of God. You want more of his spirit. You want more of his word. And when you get more of his word, you thirst for more of him. And that's why we enter into that moment of worship. And then we just, and we just say, God, you're amazing. God, you are awesome. God, you are just, oh my goodness. I just need more of you, God. I look, I'm trying to tell you, I'm getting ready to jump through this phone because I realize <laughs> that if most people would really tap into their worship, they would not struggle with half of the stuff they struggle with. But most people don't worship until they come to church. They need the background music. To, I love you, Lord. And then they go, oh, I feel holy now. No, let that holiness <laughs> reign in your home. Amen. Amen. Let it rain in your home. When you let it rain in your home, then you'll realize you you'll realize that everything that you've been missing, everything that you've been seeking other things for, is all in God. It's all in Christ. Those those depressed moments that try to creep up on you and they try to make you feel like you about to lose your mind, that you just, you just so depressed, you just ready to check out. The devil is a liar. I declare that if you just love on God, he's going to come down and show you just how much he loves you. Because just saying, you know, just saying that you go to church and you love God is not really entering into the presence of God. It's a difference. I mean, think about that. It's like there has to be some sort of intimacy. We desire intimacy from one another. But we want to give God a quickie. We don't even want to stay in church. How about that? Five yes. minutes in service. You, you ready to leave? Come on. Get into the presence of God. You, you can't be too busy to worship. You can't be. Because when you become too busy to worship, then you won't desire to read the word. Then you won't desire to keep his word. You won't desire to do none of that because there's no relationship. The things that keep you from going against God's will is the relationship that you build with God. Amen? Amen. 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 God bless you, dear. What advice do you give for someone struggling with their single season? Go ahead, say that again. Oh, I, I think I like this one right here. <laughs> what advice would you give for someone struggling with their single season? Their single season. Mm, I'm glad they said single season. <laughs> Is it just the summertime? <laughs> No, I'm just asking, you know. 
<laughs> because during the summertime, there's a certain feeling that goes on in the summertime. And then when the winter comes, you know, everybody's hibernating there. Everybody, yeah. So which season are we talking about? Oh, we talking about fall. Are, are we talking about spring? <laughs> well, listen, let me tell you something. Um, when you are single, number one, I think what most people don't realize is that when you are in Christ, there is no such thing as being single. Whew. Boy, I just blew it up right there. I know you're going to get a whole you're going to get a whole lot of ones on that one. There's no such thing as being single because when you are when you are a believer, you are married to Christ. Right? Then this is why when they have a wedding, when you get when when somebody comes into your life, then that person now Christ now he allows that person to marry you in earthly, holy sanctimony, right? Uh, uh, so there is no such thing as being single. You are married to Christ. And when you keep that in the back of your mind and you keep that in the back of your thoughts, you realize, oh, whoa, so what are you saying? So when I do something with somebody, you mean to tell me I'm sinning against Christ? What? Guess what? Not only are you sinning against Christ, but you are also causing another person to sin against Christ, which means you are now training that person to now avoid the voice of Christ and the Holy Spirit in their life. And that person is now training you and you are training them on how to cheat. How about that? You're training that person to be a cheater. And then you're going to get mad when you don't trust them after you finish doing what you do. Ooh. Boy, I'm telling you, I think I'm going to have to put a little tag. We need to put a little donation sign right there because we need an offering over here. Listen. <laughs> you, you, <laughs> listen. There's no such thing as being single. You are married to Christ. And so the problem is, now watch this. You know, I had to, um, boy, I'm, I'm going into a lot of stuff here. I, I, the Lord began to deal with me about marriage and love, right? And I was saying, God, you know, something something is not right, even with me, myself, you know, and the, and the way we are taught and brought up. From the time that we are children, there's a concept in our mind that we're supposed to be kings and queens, correct? You know, everybody wants to be a king, and I hear everybody talking about, I'm a queen, and I'm a king, I'm a queen. Well, what is Christ? And what the Lord showed me this is what God showed me. And I had to tell my wife, I had to say, honey, I'm going to be a prince. Which makes you a princess by default. Now, somebody might say, well, that, that's crazy because, you know, God raised us to king. You don't never hear God talking, Christ talking about no kings in the New Testament. You only hear about kings in the Old Testament. When Christ, when Christ, died, he became king of all kings. Right? So what I realized is that we as a people, the reason why our marriages are suffering and the reason why young girls are, 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 are having a hard time with their single season is because they're trying, they're, they're looking for a king. And they're not, they're not really looking for a prince. Because a prince, watch this now, a prince acknowledges, right, that they are governed by the king. Do you get where I'm coming from? Mm -hmm. All right. A prince acknowledges, my father is my king. When you get that, when you get that understanding, you get the understanding, right. It does answer a whole lot of questions, right? <laughs> so watch this. When you when you get when you get the understanding that you are a prince and she is a princess, you know, you never stop pursuing one another. 
And so what I realized is the Bible says, he that findeth a wife, right, findeth a good thing. See, we didn't realize that the story of Cinderella, right, the story of Cinderella was really our story about our own lives when it comes to Christ. All right? The prince goes and he finds one slip, but he's trying to find the other slipper. I'm trying to find where this shoe supposed to fit. Okay? If Cinderella, see, you ain't supposed to just be marrying just anybody. You're supposed to be marrying your princess. Okay? And if that person doesn't want to be your princess, right, then that slip don't fit. And if it don't fit, you must have quit. <laughs> you know, the reality is, is the reason why these young people, they suffer so much. And, and let me tell you something. I'm not going to sit here and try to tell you I didn't go through some of the same things you go through as young people. Yes, I did. I didn't know any better. I didn't know any better. But when you learn better, you do better. And it does not matter whether you're single or you're married because a, a married person will cheat just as well as a single person will cheat. Hello. Remember, it's not cheating against the person. It's cheating against God. And that's the reason why many men cheat on their wives because they think that they're only cheating on the woman because the woman didn't give them what they wanted. Whoo! I just preached a whole nother message. Just because she ain't giving you enough of whatever you want, right? You think it gives you a right to go out and do what you want to do, but that ain't how it go. Because when you treat on that woman, you're cheating on God. When that woman cheats on the man, she's cheating on God first. So your season of being single is the period that you should be getting closer to God as much as you can. Because the closer you are to God, the more sensitive you will be to whom you're supposed to be with. And your flesh will not be governing how you decide and choose the person. See, the, the reality is, you know, you said being single season, right? Mm -hmm. Do you want to be married? Because your single season could be for the rest of your life. But if you want to be married, then you will begin to prepare yourself now for your prince. See, kingdom love is different, okay, is different than worldly love. When you have kingdom love, okay, 